Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm sure most of you know who I am, um, but for those who don't, uh, my name is Richard Kirby. I work on the Sage support team for primarily Sage 200 and the add-ons associated with it. Um, this webinar um, is mainly to cover the new features that Sage have introduced to the product in the last few years. Um, previously, Sage used to only release a version every year and a lot of the feedback people got or, from, or a lot of the feedback Sage got from it was that most of the features were fairly mundane and basic and people didn't really know that they even existed and they didn't really help people out in terms of using it. So a few years ago, they decided to change it and they decided to implement features into the software which were based on what people who actually used the software asked for. So it's a bit of a democracy <laughs> in effect. Um, so this is just to cover off basically what the new features are um, in the last few versions, what they do. Most of you probably don't even know some of them exist. Um, some of you may already use them, but this is just to basically have a look at what they are and how they might help you. Um, appreciate there might be some questions. Um, if they are, we'll, I'll be in a position to answer those towards the end. So if you see anything or you want to ask a question about it, feel free to write it down and we can come back to it. Um, and then we can have a look at that. Um, so yeah, let's have a look. Should worth pointing out, the versions of Sage, they've been a bit, how can I word this? The version numbering's always been confusing. Um, so for example, it wasn't just Sage 200, 2018, then 19, then 20. They went with calling them basically names of seasons so you'd have like summer 2017 and then you'd have winter 2017 and so on and so on that's now changed so it's now just sage 200 the year and then if more than one version was released in the year there'd be a number after it so this version i have here today is sage 200 2021 which came out in i think it was july so this version has all the features of all the previous versions and including the one that it's released for. Um, I'm going to go, I'm not going to go through every feature that's been released, but I will send a link at the end through to you all where you can see every feature that was built into every version in ascending order. So from bottom, it'll start with the 2017 releases when they started putting in these more usable features all the way up to the top, which is 2021, which is this version. Um, this is a website hosted by Sage, so it's basically updated every time a new version comes out. Um, and on the page, you can go into each feature, see what it actually does, and there's links in more detail on how to use it. So um, this is in no real particular order, but I'll start with the older features. Um, I appreciate many of you might already know about these, but as we get to the end, it's obviously the newer stuff, so it might be stuff that you haven't heard about. Um, so yeah, um, let's start with, um, da, 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 and again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on them. It's mainly just to advise what the features are and what they do with regards to setting them up and things like that. Um, that can all be handled by either myself on support or my colleague Louise, um, or feel free to send an email in about the more, you know, how do I get it to work kind of thing. It's, it's more just to show you what these features can do, um, where they are, um, and how, how they might benefit you, I guess. Um, should also know all of these features are, they're not, they're, they're free basically, they're built into the software. So there's no there's no cost for these to be added on other than obviously the the upgrade. Um, but again, the the upgrades themselves don't cost as such. They're just it's just really the time it takes to do an upgrade. Um, should actually worth noting in the past it used to take quite a long time to upgrade a version of Sage 200. Um, we used to have to test it, and it used to take a day or two. Now it is a lot easier. Um, Upgrades can be done anywhere between 30 minutes and 
anywhere to a couple of hours. Um, it is all site dependent, so it doesn't necessarily mean that an upgrade would take 30 minutes for you. Um, it does vary from customer to customer. However, um, they are a lot easier now. So in the past, I'd speak to people say, you know, you need to upgrade Sage, your version's becoming an old one. And, you know, sometimes I'll be met with groans of, oh, it's going to take a long time. There'll be downtime, staff won't be able to use it. And sometimes it can be put off for a while. Um, now it is a lot more straightforward. Um, I've been doing these for the last couple of years now because there's been a lot of changes around, um, particularly with post Brexit transition VAT codes and CIS. Um, so I've done quite a lot and touch wood, they've all been fine and they've taken, you know, a very, very short amount of time compared to upgrades of old. So, um, again, in no particular order, I'm just going to go through some of the features, not them all, just the ones that I've picked that I think are probably the most useful to people using the software on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'll start with this, which is an invoicing module. Um, again, if some of these features aren't applicable to you, um, that, that's fine. Um, it may be that some people haven't heard of this and it might be useful for them to know it does exist in the software. Um, a lot of you'll have different versions, but most of you'll be on a version of at least three years old. So some of these features, maybe even the majority of them you'll already have. Um, towards the end of this, they'll be the newer ones that you might not have, but we'll start with the ones probably most already have, um, which is uh, we have the invoicing module um, within Sage 200. Now, before um, in Sage, if you wanted to record an invoice, you would just do it in the sales ledger. There wouldn't really be a way to print that. It would just be a record on an account. If you used sales order processing, it's obviously a more wider way of doing things. I'm on putting an order on, dispatching it, allocating stock, recording an invoice, posting the invoice, recording the payment, quite a lengthy process, um, which I'm sure some of you use. Um, but for years, um, people asked for a basic invoicing module, which Sage 200's smaller variant, Sage 50, has had in it from day one. So it's basically called invoicing. Very simple. You can put invoices and credits on. You can print them. There's no dispatch process. Um, it's basically a simple way of recording the transaction, posting it to the sales ledger, done basically. Um, so there's no, you don't have to go through the full process of using sales order processing just for the process of printing an invoice to send it to your customer. Um, there's now an inbuilt invoice and module in the system, um, which you can set up layouts for and designs. Um, and basically, it acts as a sort of a halfway house between the sales ledger and sales order processing. So most of you will already have access to this. I'm not sure how many are actually using it, um, but it's just a list, invoices and credits, which can be put on the system, printed, emailed. Basically came in about three or four years ago, but it was asked for, and I think it was actually voted as the most requested or it was our it was their most requested feature that people wanted um just a quick way of putting invoices on that didn't use stock um so they just wanted a method of basically being able to record invoices so that's in there um nothing really more to it than that um which is good doesn't require any in-depth explaining like i say many of you will already possibly be using it so um yeah so that's that's invoicing um Bank feeds, um, again, not sure if too many people are using this, but it's now possible um, within Sage 200 to have your bank statements downloaded into the cash book for reconciliation purposes. Um, so you can effectively say, right, I'm with NatWest, Santander, anything like that. Those bank statements can be downloaded securely against your cash book to make reconciliation easier. Um, obviously, I, I can't demonstrate this in too much depth because I'm not linked to an actual bank, but what you would do is you would link it to your bank. When you go into reconciliation, you'll see your transactions in Sage on one screen, one side of the screen, and you'd see the transactions 
downloaded from the bank on the other and you would be able to match them off. Um, it's secure. It's been in the system for a few years now. Um, and yeah, it's it's it, it doesn't. There's no like communication to the bank in terms of transactional. It's just a method of having your transactions from the bank in Sage, so you can pair them off instead of doing it the, I guess the, the standard way of having a statement in front of you and having to tick it off manually. Um, you can do it on screen, and flag transactions against each other. Um, it's compatible with most of the popular banks, but there are some other banks that you can do a search for. Um, as you can see, long list here, and this list is forever grown. So basically, um, ooh, the list is so long it crashed the program. Um, so yeah, there's loads of banks. Um, you can link it to and that's called sage bank feeds a lot of these a lot of these features it's probably just worth mentioning that when an upgrade comes in it might not be known that these features are there because they haven't necessarily been enabled so if you do see any features today that you think you'd like um feel free to send me an email or through to support and we can certainly have a look at enabling those features within your system because they may they may not be there so you might not see them because they haven't been enabled in the background um within sage all menus buttons are customizable so they can be not necessarily visible for all users um or even main users and that might not be intentional um because when a new feature goes in from an upgrade it isn't necessarily given to everyone straight away um what next? Uh, you can now hide nominal codes, bank accounts and budgets. So in the past you couldn't, you could only hide balances um, and say don't show balance on the main list view. Now you can actually hide nominal accounts so they no longer appear on screen. This doesn't just extend to nominal accounts, um, it's now also possible to hide customer accounts and purchase ledger accounts. It's always been the status quo with Sage of you can't delete things that have been used in the past. And I get asked this a lot, um, even if accounts haven't been used for years, sometimes there's a need just to get rid of them, um, delete them entirely, possibly for GDPR reasons, but now it is actually possible to hide an account. If an account is hidden, it cannot be used against a transaction. So if you've got a customer you wouldn't want to make any sort of trading with or a supplier you wouldn't want to trade with, you can now change the account status from active to hidden and it can't be used anywhere in the software. There's always been on hold, which would still let you put a transaction on. It would just flag that the account's on hold, but it would still let you do that first step. Um, but now it is possible to actually hide an account. So that's a nominal account, customer account, or a supplier account. Um, so that's pretty new. Um, what else do we have? Uh, there's Google Maps integration now with Sage. I'm um, not sure how many people have seen that, but if you've got an address in a supplier or customer account, there's the Google icon there, press that. It'll take you straight to the address. Um, it hasn't on this occasion because it's demo data and there isn't a direct address in it, but if there was a valid address in it with a postcode, um, it would basically show that exact location. So that's pretty new. Um, do, do, do. The spooler, um, I'm not sure many people use the spooler. So the spooler basically would collect reports um for users that had their output mode in sage set to spooler so i'm sure most of you know what choose output mode does but i'm pretty sure many people won't every user has the ability to say in sage how reports sort of get generated so you've got three options um one is printer which isn't used quite a lot but if you run a report, it wouldn't preview on screen, it wouldn't go to the spooler, it would literally just come out of whatever your default printer on your PC is. Preview, which is most commonly used, uh, will preview it on screen and then you can choose to print it or export it. 
um, or save it as a PDF or something like that, send it to Excel maybe. Um, and Spooler, which will save a copy of the report and it'll put it in here. Now, the problem with this until recently was it would get full as time goes by and accessing the screen would sometimes take minutes. Um, I know this because it would be a common thing that I would have to fix and uh, we'd have to clear out the spooler maybe once or twice a year. Um, it's now been redesigned so that even with a large quantity of information in your spooler, it would still open up quickly. Obviously, network speed dependent, but in most cases it would open up very quickly and you can now filter which user. So if you wanted to look at what you've sent the spooler, you could choose your username and you could say whether it's been printed or not. And you've got a filter for date range in here as well. So this is this is the new spooler, which was implemented a couple of years ago now, I believe. Um, so yeah, it's a lot quicker. It doesn't require much maintenance, if any. Um, it'll just open and you'll be able to view documents in there, um, providing you have access to the spooler. Um, what else do we have? Um, customer alerts. So you can select a customer and you can go to the alerts tab in here. And you can basically have some text that will appear whenever you do any of these transactions. So if you were to enter a sales order, you could have an alert come up. Um, or whenever you enter an invoice or credit note, you can have something that would always come up against that particular customer. Um, it's not in suppliers, but it does allow you to put things that pop up automatically and just come on the screen as a message and you just press OK and they'll just be sort of removed from there. So that's customer alert. Um, what else do we have? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, this this is um, quite an interesting one. So now you can scan and attach documents in Sage 200. Um, previously, you would have to pay for an add on to do this. Um, but now Sage have recognized that it's quite a popular thing. You know, if you receive a purchase invoice, you'd want to tie it back into the system um, rather than have, you know, not necessarily a paper copy, reduced paper, always a good thing. Um, so you can either record that or scan that document rather at point of recording an invoice, which is just done by the save and attach option. You can attach a file. There's my invoice. Stored. I can press view to view it. And then I can save it. And it's now logged against that transaction that I've just entered. And then you can see if we go into transaction inquiry. There's a paperclip icon next to the transaction to say there is a document against it. It is possible to host those documents in the cloud either via OneDrive for business or Dropbox. So as well as those documents being sort of sat locally within your server on your network that everyone has access to, it is possible to have them also um accessible via the cloud which at the moment is limited to dropbox or onedrive for business um that can happen on supplier transactions um it can happen to it can be attached to nominal transactions um credit notes invoices for sales um dispatch notes any transaction really you can add an attachment to and it's stored against that customer supplier or nominal account um, with the potential then to be hosted in the cloud should you wish that. So that's a nice little touch because previously you would have to buy an add-on to do that um, but you can actually now just do it in Sage by default um, scanning and attaching documents to transactions.
Um, let's see what else. Um, we now have a more detailed audit log within Sage. So I've had this in the past where people have wanted to see what what may have gone on in the background within Sage in terms of like if, um, as an example, if a supplier's bank details have been changed. Um, and in the past, the answer was always no. Um, it isn't possible to see that, but now you can basically see events within Sage. There aren't any in this set of data because I've not changed any details, but if I did, um, well, let's just demonstrate that very quickly. So if I change some bank details, or add bank details, That before would never be recorded anywhere. Um, there would be no way of knowing if a user has done that, um, no way of checking behind the scenes. Um, if someone's got access to do it, they can do it. Um, and it basically would happen. So now we can see I've changed the bank details and it's identified administrator, which is me, that I've done that. Um, so there's more, I think this is a feature that's gonna be developed more, but at the moment you can see bank details being changed and purchase requisitions which i'll come on to shortly about what they are but there's a bit more traceability of things that have gone on in sage in the behind the scenes um which actually leads me on to a feature that has been requested so many times i've lost track but it's finally in um supply bank details so i've been asked many many times before is it possible to not allow someone to have access to supplier bank details. Um, that's not necessarily a trust thing. It's just, you know, sensitivity of information, um, especially in the, you know, the age we're living in. Um, so answer was always no, couldn't do it. Now you can. It is possible to remove this tab entirely from users. Whereas in the past, um, the only way to remove visibility to bank details would be to completely deny someone access to supplier account, um, which isn't practical because users may need to go in, mend addresses, update email addresses, things like that. Um, so it wasn't really practical. That was always my answer. And it was always an answer I didn't like giving because it is an answer, but it's not gonna work. So now it's possible to remove access to the bank tab and just that tab on its own um it's not possible to remove any of the other tabs it's a case of if you can get into this screen you'll see everything but the exception now is that the bank area can be omitted from that screen um should people wish for whatever reason um that was requested a lot i think came in second just behind the adding of an invoice module um Next thing, um, th this is a this is another big one. So, in in the past with Sage, if if you wanted to do an import, so say you wanted to update something against all your customers or suppliers, so that might be maybe like an analysis code where you have maybe I don't know. An account manager, for example, might exist on a customer's account who looks after that account, for example. You'd have to go in and manually change that. Um, I would be asked quite a lot, is there any way we can do an import to our customers to update a field? And the answer was always no. Um, it was no for anything, basically. You couldn't update via an import. You could only import new material. So it's the same for stock. If something on stock needs to change, you know, you've got to go in manually and do it basically. So if you've got like 5,000, 6,000 stock items and you need to change one thing in one record, it would actually sometimes be easier for people just to re-import the whole lot again um, as new items, which then doubles up your stock inventory in Sage. But now it is possible to do what's called import and update. So if you're doing an import, you can do, 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 where are we import and export. You can do import accounts and this box here, update account if it exists is new. So 
this is on important of customer records, supplier records, uh, stock records, and nominal accounts. So those four things, um, if you need to change something on mass, then basically you can export it all out to Excel, change the relevant columns value, and then re-import, and then you basically just tick that box. If you don't tick that box, it'll do what it used to do, which is recognize it already exists and it won't do anything basically. Um, but if you tick that box, it'll it'll change anything that you've changed on that file against that either customer supplier or stock record or nominal account. Um, that That's a pretty, that's a big improvement because that saves quite a lot of time if you're making changes to things. Um, so in the example I used before with account, if an account manager needed changing, there might have been a reshuffle where one account manager now looks after other accounts and that account manager's old accounts are looked after by someone else. You'd have to go in, manually change the field on every record. I've seen it before where they've basically, had, they've had to divide the work up between four or five people and it's took half a day to do. Now you can just export it all to Excel, five minutes, 10 minutes even, change the values and bring it back in as new information. Um, should always be careful when doing imports though. Um, obviously when you do an import, there's always the option to validate your records before. So that basically just shows you if it's going to work and what it's going to change. Um, and then there's obviously validate and import, which just does it. Um, so I was advised that anyone doing an import of any kind or select this option first. So they can actually see the changes they've made on screen on the form of a report. And then if they're happy with that, then select that option um, into there. Um, what else do we have? Um, it should probably be also worth me mentioning, obviously we looked at document storage before where you can link documents to accounts. Um, remittances in Sage 200 is a bit of a, a strange one because you can only print remittances at the time you do your payment run. Um, it's now possible to store those remittances against suppliers. Um, so it's probably just worth mentioning that as part of the generate payments process, it will store those remittances um, sort of against the supplier account so that they're accessible. Um, I've had it quite a few times where someone's done a payment run, the remittance either didn't print because they viewed it on screen and didn't hit print or there was an issue with the printer or something along those lines. Um, and then the payment run had been finished, it was deleted um, and there was no way to get those remittances back afterwards. And the workaround is unallocate all your payments and do it again, which is far from practical. So now you can actually have them saved as a PDF against the suppliers for when you've run that remittance. So that's another good one. Um, this is a simple one, but it's a bit of a time saver. Um, accounting periods. So if you were opening and closing accounting periods, you'd basically have to do one at a time. And each one would take, I don't know, depend on the number of transactions that were pending, a couple of minutes or maybe 30 seconds, and you'd have to wait for it to finish before you did the next. New feature now where you can do close all or open all. Um, just does what it says on the tin. Quite a simple thing, but saves a bit of time. Um, so that basically does that. Um, VAT codes. Um, this was a big one at the beginning of the year. So basically now, although they're not set up by default, um we now have new vat codes for reverse charged cis which appreciate will probably affect not many too many people but it'll depend what industry you're involved with and this one which is postponed vat accounting um there weren't really any workarounds before these came in other than to upgrade so you had the functionality but the latest versions of Sage 200 will have access to these. So anyone that's upgraded in the last 
18 months, I would say, will have access to these. Um, if you're unsure or something you need to speak to me about, feel free to get in touch. Um, but yeah, anyone who's upgraded in the last 18 months will have access to these. And there wasn't really many workarounds for this. I know some things you can not choose not to upgrade because it's not the right time um, and just sort of utilize a workaround. But these are now in all the latest versions. It doesn't set the code up for you when you upgrade for those things. You still have to come into this screen and actually create it. But you can actually say this VAT code is for CIS reverse charge sales. This one is for purchases and this one is for one VAT accountant. Um, and there's no limit on the number of codes you can set in here. Um, you just use a code, a number of what what's going to be sort of relevant to you or familiar to you. But yeah, they're all built into there as well. Um, into the software. Um, also on the back of the CIS reverse charge text um, that is available to be put on sales invoices now because I know there is a requirement for invoices to have some text on it. Um, that can be put onto invoices very easily. Um, let's see what else we have um, to do. OK, just going to touch on sort of web users within Sage. So don't know if many of you are aware it is possible to access Sage outside of Sage in the form of a web user. So a web user is possibly someone who doesn't necessarily have access to Sage of the product, but might need to reference certain things like customer details or supplier details or view transactions. Um, this can be done in the form of workspaces, which are basically online. Now these can be opened up to the internet in general, although the majority of people will access them just internally on their works internet, intranet, sorry, but these can be accessed externally um, with a little bit of configuration. So they could be accessed on a tablet or a phone, anything with a browser on it, a uh, compatible browser on it. So there's two parts to this. So this are the works. These are the workspaces that are in Sage by default that you can access online or on the intranet as a web user. You don't have to be a full Sage user for this, just a web user. And I believe a web user works out. I think the cost for license is a, it's around eight pound per month per user. Now that's a named user. Um, and it means that if you've got two web users, but you've got five people who potentially might want to use it, it's not like Sage 200 where you just log any two of the five in at a time. It's like a named user. So you say, right you will have access to this license and you will have access to that one so you would just you would just acquire however many, however many licenses you feel you would need so all these workspaces are available in here i'm in a browser i'm not in sage i could be a web user and i can view so sales ledger customer list got access to what is similar to the customer list screen in sage um, now through here, you can't actually do any transaction inputs. This is mainly just like a view screen and inquiry screen. However, although I can't demonstrate this on my image, this has been opened up to something called a web portal. So it links to your Microsoft 365 account. And Basically, it gives a web user the ability to do actual inputting. So that would be create, amend, view customer accounts, enter invoices, enter credits. Same with suppliers, um, nominal ledger, bank account, stock. You could create stock. You can basically do a lot of the functionality in Sage. So whereas these are just like a view, look, report on sort of areas. The web portal, which is new, and I'll send a link with more information on that, allows you to actually do transactional input, creating records and accounts and things like that externally. And again, that can be opened up to the web securely. So you could effectively be anywhere in the country outside of the office and you would be able to enter a transaction directly into Sage 200. Um, so that might be... Um, a sales invoice or something like that, or a purchase 
requisition, for example. So that's called the web portal and um, that's new. That is in the release that came out in July of this year. Um, but it would be for web users to access basically. Um, so again, I can provide more information to anyone on that if they're interested in it. Um, maybe they've got like someone who it's not really worth installing Sage for and giving them full access and haven't have a like, you know, a full license for, but it would be nice for them to enter transactions ad hoc and um, just via the internet. Maybe someone who's field based, who isn't necessarily in an office in front of a machine PC all the time. Um, they can do it via the web portal uh, and you can customize what access that user would have access to. So you could say, right, you just have access to enter transactions. You can't actually go in and amend accounts. You can basically determine what that person has access to. Um, so that that's pretty much that's the latest feature. Um, couple of other things. Um, Excel reports you used to have to pay for these. Um, so this isn't like um, you previewing a report and sending it to Excel. Everyone's always been able to do that, providing you've got Excel. Um, but Excel reporting, this used to cost. Um, all these now are in Sage and they are free of charge. Um, this came in July this year's version. So if you upgrade the latest version or if you have done in the last few months by myself, um, all these basically Excel files which you are stored sort of centrally within Sage and they are free to access. Whereas in the past you had to pay for which ones you want. Um, so they've decided to just make them um, available to everyone. Um, let's see. Da, da. What else do we have? There are a couple of other things which I haven't mentioned. Um, mainly because they're either minor things or if they're a bit niche and people might not sort of have any need for them, but again, they'll all be on the link, which you'll be able to look at. Um, there's stuff to do with online payments, Stripe, PayPal, Go Cardless, things like you can, on your sales invoices, you can add a button onto the invoice. So when you save it an email as a PDF, your customer presses the button on the invoice. Um, it might say pay now, for example, and it'll take them to a screen where they can make a direct payment, um, which would link back to your Sage um, as shown as being paid. Um, so there's information on that. Um, that's again, that's another one of those things that you normally had to pay for because it was like an add-on, whereas now it's just within Sage, although you may have to pay for a subscription of some kind for uh, Go Cardless or PayPal. But in terms of actually having the functionality within Sage, that is free of charge um, and it's in there. Uh, making tax digital, I think everyone's doing that at the minute. So that's submitting your VAT returns online. Um, that hasn't changed much. Um, HMRC have added some new security guidelines um, a few months ago. Um, and it was a bit unclear whether everyone had to go through another upgrade again immediately. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to submit your VAT return, which would be um, a bit of a problem. But um, that's all still working fine. The newer versions have these new security requirements built into them uh, and HMRC are sort of happy for Sage to rule that out as people upgrade. Because um, obviously it's not it's not just a case of, you know, you can just upgrade now or within a few minutes. Um, it's something that needs to be planned in, albeit it is taking a lot less time than it used to. So um, making tax digital is still the same. Um, Let's see. Um, I'll just worth mentioning, I'm not sure if many people are aware of this, but um, most of you will have access to Sage 200 um, services. Um, so this is part of the license that you basically purchase with a subscription. Um, just a brief one, you get three free reports a year designed by Sage. Um, so you can basically schedule an appointment with Sage for a 15 minute call. If there's a bespoke report you would want creating, you know, which might take sort of an hour or two to build. Um, in the past, those would be chargeable, um, mainly because of the time it would take. But Sage now have a dedicated team that work on that. So if any of you have looked at, you know, have not been able to find a report in the software or in the past you've asked and it's, it's, it's you know, it's been said, well, it could be built, but it would, it would cost this much or it would take this long to build. Um, 
everyone who has a CH200 license will have an allowance of three free reports a year. Basically, that can be created by Sage. Um, it's direct between you and Sage. So they have an appointment with you for 15 minutes. That report can be created um, within reason, you know, as long as it's not something that's, you know, massively complicated. Um, and they'll aim to build that report within five working days, but it's normally a lot less than that. They're pretty quick and they will load it in your system for you. So you have access to it. So that's three free a year um, that you get with Sage now. So that's another new thing. It's been in a little while, but um, it's 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 something a lot of people don't know about. Um, I will also link to the following page in the email after, which is this screen. This is the Sage 200 roadmap. So basically it's just divided into three sections. Um, what they've delivered, what's coming in the next release, and what's coming in the future. Um, like I say, like I said earlier, they do look to hear from people as to what kind of things they'd want. Um, that can either done by you advising me and me going to Sage and raising it as like a wish list or an idea, and it can be logged on the ideas hub, um, or you can sign up to this yourselves and basically add something in here to say we would really like this. Um, most people come to me, which is fine. I can collate them all and then pass them on to Sage, but they are sort of looking now at what, what people want rather than them putting things in they think might be useful and, and a lot of the stuff is, but they now do listen like to what actually people want, what will be more convenient, make the software more usable. So that's it really. Um, I will send the link. This is basically the list of all the new features. I'll send a link to this. It's got the version number, all the features below it, and then you can click in to each feature and it'll tell you about that feature. Um, and it'll tell you, you know, there'll be links to more more in-depth information. Um, this is on the Sage online help file, which you can access within the Sage in any screen by pressing F1 on your keyboard. It's an online page. So it's updated by Sage. It's not updated by me or HBP. It's by Sage who produced the software, which is good. It's updated pretty quickly. Um, but I'll link to this new features list with all the new stuff in it by different version. Um, don't worry if you're not too sure about what version you're on, because I appreciate it doesn't actually say clearly within the software summer 2019 anywhere. It actually says a number and then the number equates to a version. So it might say 12.00.43 which would relate to a version which I just look up. I've kind of got them mostly memorized, but um, if you're ever unsure about what version you're on, uh, feel free to get in touch with me and I can say, okay, you're on this version. So you would have, so say you're on, I don't know, summer 2019, you would have summer 2019 and all the features below that. So if you're having a look, if you're checking this out and you're not sure what version you're on, so you're not sure which ones you have or don't have, then just ask me and I can tell you what version you're on. And if you have got any questions about any of the features, um, that's fine. So um, anyone have any questions? I've talked for long enough, I think. Voice is starting to go. Um, if you have, just unmute in chat or post in chat. Um, if you've got any questions on these, on the new features, anything like that, feel free to ask. Um, if not, I will send all of this information in an email for you so you've got it um but yeah that's it really like i say new features there's releasing about two versions a year at the minute two to three a year um if any are mandatory and include something like a, a change of, like a vat code change or legislation change we would get in touch with you and say a new version's coming out and it's got this in um which is going to sort of help with this change that the government's doing or a change in VAT rate or something like that, we would get in touch with you about that. But versions that just come out with new features, we don't necessarily reach out to everyone and say this version's coming out. Um, although we may plan to do like an email upon each release, um, but there's no sort of set date and time when Sage release a version. It's just like as and when they do a product release. But at the moment it's about um, one every sort of three to six months. Um, all right, we've got a question. Um, if you hide customer supplier accounts, do they still appear in reports? Yes. 
So if you used a customer for a transaction a year ago, but you've since hidden it, you would still be able to report on that. Um, if you ran a list of accounts, but it was hidden, it would still report on that. The hide functionality is just from screens. So if you hide a stock item, if you hide a supplier account, a nominal account or customer account, if you hide it, it, it just disappears from the screen and it won't allow you to process a transaction on it. Um, if you report on it for when you've used it prior to being prior to it being hidden, you'll still be able to report on it because the data has already been created. It's already there. Um, the hide thing is just it. I guess it's if you are doing like an in-house tidy up of your data, you know, the customer list was massive. You want to make it shorter because when you were scrolling through things to find accounts, there was a load of accounts on there that were old, unused, things like that. It's mainly to tidy up things like that. Um, so yeah and you can also do the import routine that i was mentioning earlier so if you wanted to do it on mass as opposed to going through every on account every account and hiding it you could export all your customers to excel change all the ones that are inactive to hidden and then re-import it tick the update box and you would basically have a, a less long customer list for customers you know who you know you, you may not want on the list again um if you did try and add that same customer, it would come up and it would say, you've already got them, they are hidden. And then you would just unhide them, basically, and bring them back. So uh, yeah, um, do, the three, do the three free Sage reports include BI reports too? Uh, no, they don't. Um, they don't at this time. Um, if I'm being honest, I don't think they will because of the shift from Sage BI to Power BI, which is basically using Power BI within Office to integrate straight with the data. So there'll be information on that on the email that goes out after this about Power BI, and there's more connectivity now with Microsoft apps and things like that. Um, it's something that I think's taken off pretty quick. Um, certainly, we're looking at it. So. Um, it doesn't include BI at this stage, and if I'm honest, I, I don't think it will because of that shift over to Power BI that Sage seemed to be promoting. Um, on the import function, can you add a new customer? If so, what details do you need? Right, um, yeah, you can add new customers via the import. Um, what you need will be as a minimum. So if you're importing customer accounts, there'll be a template. The template will basically tell you what is mandatory and what isn't. Um, import. So basically, it'll be things like code, um, name. Um, what else might be mandatory? Don't think addresses. Um, but basically, yeah, there's. If you come in here and basically just do customer account import XLS. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll demo how it works with F1. So basically, if I was going to do an import, if I go import accounts, and if I press F1, it takes me straight to this page. And if you have a look at that, I can open this because I don't have Excel, but if you were to press that, it'll open up and across the top, it'll say mandatory and optional. The columns that are mandatory are just the mandatory ones. So I think it's code and name off the top of my head, um, but I don't believe it's like a large amount of information. But yeah, you can you can import you can import customer accounts on mass. So that's fine. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. Great. Um, so thanks for joining. I will send an email out with uh, the links to the version features. Um, and then if you've got any questions about what version you're on or a feature that you've seen either on this web page or that I've mentioned today, um, just get in touch um, and I can advise if you've either got it or how to use it or anything like that. If you've got the version and the feature, it's free. Um, the only exception would be is if you're looking at a feature that integrates with something like Microsoft 365, then that might rely on B365 
be reliant on you having a Microsoft 365 account, um, which I'm sure most of most of you probably will. Um, but the features themselves in Sage aren't sort of they're not chargeable or anything like that, um, as long as you have said version um, or above. So, yeah, uh, thanks for joining everyone. Um, I'm sure I'll speak to a lot of you soon. I'll see a few familiar names in there. Um, those I haven't spoken to, uh, thanks for coming along. Um, we might do another one of these at some point, um, maybe covering on the next release, um, just to have a look, because there's a lot of things that um, that people don't know about. I, I find this quite a lot. People um, sort of don't necessarily know that they've got or they haven't got these features. I get it quite a lot. Um, possibly people using it for years, <laughs> which I've actually seen. So um, yeah, you know, ask, you know, you might be surprised what is in there, has been in there for a while um, or not. So um, yeah, thanks all for joining everyone. Like I say, any any questions after this, just just send me an email. Um, I'm here for the rest of the day or, or you can contact me on the support line um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. So uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Goodbye.